Experience Life, what's up? Good to see you guys. I also want to welcome those of you watching at Church Online or our downtown campus, our Amarillo campus. We are pumped that you're joining us as well. And when I was 21, I started as a youth pastor at a large church here in town. And I, I'm really thankful to that church for giving me an opportunity uh, in ministry at such a, uh, such a young age. I really have no idea what they were thinking, uh, but, but everything turned out okay. And during that time when I was a youth pastor, <clears throat> Pastor Chris was on staff at that church with me. Um, I would often fill in for um, our pastor when he was out of town uh, speaking. Uh, and we went through a period of time where we didn't have a pastor for about a year. And oftentimes uh, during that, that, uh, that period, I would speak and, and, and fill in for the church. And I did a message one time for that church um, that Chris said was one of his favorites that I ever did. And it was one of my favorites too. And I think the reason why it was one of Chris's favorites because he would say that, man, that just changed my life. I was lost and then I heard you speak and it just changed everything for me. And um, so I think, you know, if this, if this message, you know, could change uh, a life like Chris, then man, there's hope for all of us today. So um, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Uh, but hey, let's get started. Jesus had this group of followers that in the Bible, in the New Testament were called disciples. They did life with him, they followed him, they learned from him. When he, after he died on the cross, they saw him risen from the dead. These guys were with Jesus for a period of about three years and they left everything to follow Jesus. Jesus came up uh, to several of them and said, hey, c come follow me. And they would, they would leave their jobs and their livelihoods and, and property and all kinds of things to go and to follow Jesus. And the Bible calls them disciples. The Greek word in the New Testament is methetes, which literally means a, a student or a follower or a learner of someone. And so we have these disciples, these followers of Jesus, and, and we learn a lot about them. We find out a lot about them in, in the Gospels in the New Testament, in the book Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We, we, we learn a lot about these guys. We, we, we see some more in the book of Acts, and we know some of their story. But I bet a lot of us don't know what ended up happening with the disciples. Like, what happened to them that we don't know about or it's not recorded in the Bible? How did they die? What, 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 what did they end up doing? Where did they end up going? Well, most of the disciples would end up dying for their belief that Jesus rose from the dead. They died because they were teaching and, and preaching to, to everyone they came in contact with that you had to put your faith in Jesus and commit your life to Jesus in order to be right with God. And, and there wasn't another way to heaven. Jesus was the only way to heaven. And so they're going around telling everybody everywhere that Jesus is the way, he's the truth, he, he's the life. No one goes to heaven except through him. And they're saying that Jesus rose from the dead and we saw him with our own eyes and, and it would cost them their lives. Most of them most of the 12 would die as martyrs. And history records that these guys died in some crazy, painful ways. Check this out. This is Andrew. Andrew died in Greece. He was crucified on an X-shaped cross because he didn't feel worthy to die on the same cross that Jesus had died on. Bartholomew was believed to be preaching in India, and he was filleted and skinned alive with knives. James, the, the brother of John, was beheaded by Herod Agrippa. James, the different James, son of Alphaeus, was crucified in Egypt. His body was sawed in pieces. Other accounts say that he might have been beaten to death after being thrown off the top of a temple. John an attempt was made on his life by giving him a cup of poison and, and he survived it. And so he survives that. So he's sentenced to be boiled in oil, in a vat of oil at the Colosseum. And while he's being boiled alive at the Colosseum in this vat of oil, he keeps preaching and he keeps talking about Jesus. And when they began to see that the oil, the burning oil was not causing him any pain or, or suffering, he was sent, he was banished to an island called Patmos, where he ended up dying of natural causes. Next is Jude. Jude was preaching in present-day Iraq and Iran, and he was shot to death with arrows 
at Mount Ararat. Matthew laid down his life for Jesus on a missionary journey. He disappeared and, and people didn't really hear from him, but it was believed that he was speared to death or he was beheaded. Different accounts say different things. Peter, Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to die in the same manner that his Lord Jesus had died. Philip believed that he was died by, uh, by being hanged or, or through crucifixion, and he requested that his body would, wouldn't be wrapped in fine linens like the body of Jesus because he didn't feel worthy to have his body treated in the same way that Jesus' body had been treated. Simon the Zealot, he died on a, the mission field as a martyr. He wasn't heard from, but many people think that he was crucified and that his body was sawed into pieces. Thomas went preaching in present day Iraq, Iran, and India, and he ended up being killed with the spears and burned alive. And the Matthias, who would take Judas's place, Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus, would go and um, committed suicide. And Matthias took his place, and he was tied to a cross and stoned to death. And so that's the 12. These guys were willing to die for Jesus in these horrible ways because they couldn't stop talking about the fact that they had seen Jesus risen from the dead. They loved Jesus so much and they were so convinced that Jesus had risen from the dead that they were willing to die horrible deaths for the truth that they said they saw, that they eyewitness. And there's been countless others throughout church history many of which have died in the same way. Paul, that we read about, who wrote most of the New Testament in the Bible, Paul was beheaded himself. And this same fate has been the case for many people throughout church history who've said they believed that Jesus was risen from the dead and that through his death on the cross, we could be made right with God. And people wouldn't turn from that. And throughout church history, people have suffered the same kind of deaths, tortured and suffered and died because of their faith in Jesus. And here's the thing, think about this with me. One day, if you're a follower of Jesus, one day in heaven, you're gonna see him. And they're gonna see you. And they're gonna tell you their story. You're gonna hear their story about their life and the way they lived for Jesus and the way that they died for Jesus. You're, you're, gonna, you're gonna hear that story. And they're gonna look at you and you're gonna look at them and they're gonna say, well, what about you? What about your life? And you're like, uh, yeah, same thing. Yeah, that, that was, uh, me too. Uh, wait, I think I hear something. Uh, we're gonna stand before them one day. We're, we're going to see them one day. And people throughout church history, again, that have given their life to Jesus, we're going we're to see them, we're going to hear their stories. And the question I have for you is, what's your story going to be? What's your story going to be? Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 15, said, he, Jesus, died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've committed your life to Christ, the Bible says, Paul would tell us, listen, you're no, you're, your life is no longer about yourself. Your life is now to be lived for Jesus. It's no longer about you and, and your plans. It's about Jesus and, and his plans and his plans are best and, and what Jesus has told us to do and called us to do is best. So are you living for yourself and, and your plans or are you living for Jesus and what he called us to do? Missionary named Nate Saint was asked this question. He said, he was asked, why do we waste our lives as missionaries? And he responded with this. He said, they forget that they too are expending their lives and when the bubble has burst, they will have nothing of eternal significance to show for it. You see, every one of us are are living for things in our life that either have eternal value or, or maybe they don't. See, so much of the things that we care about in this life and, and spend so much time on and care so much about and give so much of ourself, our time and our money and our energy to, they just don't matter in light of eternity. And here's, let me show you what I mean. 
Game six of the NBA Finals is the Miami Heat and the, the San Antonio Spurs. Anybody watch that game? Remember that game? Okay, a lot of hands are going up in the air. Okay, uh, very memorable game, okay? Uh, because the, the, there's, the Heat are down. They're down by three, and there's about 10 seconds left, and, and, and LeBron jacks up this three-point shot, okay? And me and Mark, Mark Tatum, our downtown worship pastor, and Brandon Gwynn, our Southwest w- uh, worship pastor, are all at Brandon's house watching this game, okay? And, and Brandon is a huge Spurs fan, okay? Huge Spurs fan. He's got all of his, you know, he's got his Spurs hat on, his T-shirt, and all this kind of, no, I'm just kidding, but, but he is. He's a huge Spurs fan. And so we're all watching this game and it's, they're down by two. And if the Spurs, or they're down by three, if the Spurs win this game, they win the NBA championship. The series is over. And so LeBron takes this three point shot and it goes off the rim and the ball is bouncing around and, and, and it's bouncing around and people are trying to get it. And Chris Bosch hits the ball over to the corner where Ray Allen is in the corner awaiting this ball. He grabs it and he steps back and he shoots a three point shot and Brandon is going, no. And at the same time, I, I know that Barry Alvis, our prayer pastor and Caleb Green, our Amarillo worship pastor are saying, yes, because they're Miami Heat fans, big, big, big heat fans. I'm a Lakers fan, so I didn't really care about any of them. one of them. Oh man, we got mixed feelings on that. Um, so Ray Allen hits this shot, a three point shot at the end of the, uh, end of the game. There's five seconds left, goes to overtime. And Brandon says this, he says, it's over. The heat are going to win the game and they're going to win game seven. And sure enough, that's what happened. The Spurs won in overtime, I mean, I'm sorry, the Heat won in overtime of game six, and they went on to win game seven. But let me ask you this question, okay? A a lot of America is watching this game and, you know, just on the edge of their seat, like freaking out about what's about to happen, and Ray Allen hits the shot, and people are going crazy. I mean, crazy. But let me ask you this question. Do you think Jesus like seeing that game, sees Ray Allen hit this shot and is like, guys, look, did you see that shot? You think Jesus was like, man, what an incredible shot. Or do you think Jesus, when Christian actors or professional athletes go to heaven one day, you think he's going to ask them for their autograph? I I just, I, I don't think so. Because those things are really important to us. It's just one example. But they're just not that important in light of eternity. You know, Jesus said all of heaven rejoices when one person commits their life to Jesus. Their sin is forgiven. They're made right with God. The Bible says their their name is written in what's called the book of life, which means they've received eternal life. They're going to be in heaven with Jesus one day. And the Bible says that heaven rejoices when one person commits their life to Jesus and is now right with God. That's what heaven gets excited about. That's what heaven gets pumped up about because those are the things that matter in light of eternity. I'm gonna tell you a story about a man named C.T. Studd in This guy grew up in England and it was a part of a very wealthy and aristocratic, powerful family in England. Had incredible future lined out for him. And not only that, he was great at a sport called cricket. And if you don't know what cricket is, it's kind of an English version of baseball. It's kind of weird to me, but, but he was incredible at this game. And he could have gone on to be a professional athlete in cricket. And so he's praying about what, what does God want me to do with my life? Like I, I've got everything set up for me as far as my family with, with, with money and, and power. I, I've got fame and money and everything awaiting for me in, in, in being a professional athlete in this game. And so he's praying about what to do. And he, he comes across this booklet that was written by an atheist. And here's what the booklet said. Check this out. It said, if I firmly believed, as millions say they do, that the knowledge and practice of religion in this life influences destiny in another, then religion would mean everything to me. 
I would cast away earthly enjoyments as dross, earthly cares as follies, and earthly thoughts and feelings as vanity. Religion would be my first waking thought and my last image before sleep sank me into unconsciousness. I should labor in this cause alone. I would take thought for tomorrow and eternity alone. I would esteem one soul gain for heaven worth a life of suffering. Earthly conses would never stay my hand or seal my lips. Earth, its joys and its griefs would occupy no moment of my thought. I would strive to look upon eternity alone and on the immortal souls around me, soon to be everlastingly happy or everlastingly miserable. I would go forth to the world and preach it in season and out of season. And my text would be, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? C.T. Studd had everything lined out for him. His plans, money, power, fame, regardless of the track that he took, everything was set for him. But God really challenged him through this booklet and C.T. Studd left everything. And people said all around him, his family, his friends, everybody was saying, this guy, he's wasting his whole career. He's wasting his life. The CT stud, he went to China for a while and he ended up spending most of the rest of his life in, in Africa telling people who had never heard about Jesus the good news that Jesus came and died for them so that they could be right with God. And I guarantee you that when one of those Africans committed their life to Jesus, heaven took notice of that. Because see, that's what makes sense in light of eternity. And so my question for you is, are you living a life that makes sense in light of eternity? Are you living for Jesus? Paul said, are you living for him who died and rose again? Or are you living for yourself, for your own plans, your own dreams? You know the story of the 12 now. What happened to them, the way that they lived their lives, the way they died for their belief in Jesus, for their love and their passion for Jesus. You know the story of the 12. And so here's my challenge for you today. Be one of the 13. Be one of the 13. And here's here's what I mean by that. There have been countless others like Paul and like the 12 who have given their life to Jesus. They were willing to die for Jesus. And it's like every one of those people, every one of those kinds of people that believe that Jesus rose from the dead and and live for Jesus and are willing to die for Jesus and have that same kind of love and, and passion and drive, every one of them, it's like they're number 13. And I wanna challenge you to be one of the 13 that lives a life that makes sense in light of eternity, that is lived for him who died and rose again, that's lived for Jesus. Be one of the 13. Just like countless others throughout church history have been. And as you consider that, I want you to remember this. Jesus gave his life for you. Jesus gave up his life for you. The Bible says that he died on the cross to rescue you and I from our sin. You, you and I, every, every one of us, the Bible says we, we had fallen short of God's standard to have a relationship with him, to go to heaven when we die because of our sin. The Bible says every one of us have. We've fallen short of that standard. And Jesus came because he loved you so much and he loved me so much. He came and did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves and he gave up his life as a sacrifice for you. He sacrificed his life for you. The Bible says that because we've sinned, there's a fine to be paid. There's a punishment for our sin. There's a consequence for our sin. And the Bible says that fine for sin is eternity separated from God in a place called hell. Because you see, just like when you break man's law, you pay man's fine. Well, when you break God's law, you pay God's fine. Some of us are are here today and 
We've sinned, we've, we've fallen short of God's standard to have a relationship with him to go to heaven when we die. And we think that maybe if I'm just good enough, if I'm a good enough person or if I try really hard, maybe somehow I'll be right with God. Maybe somehow he'll let me in to heaven. If my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds or, or maybe because I was baptized as an infant or, or a child, maybe God will let me into heaven because of that. And the Bible says that's not true. The Bible actually says salvation is not a reward for the good things that we've done. In other words, good people don't go to heaven, forgiven people do. And the Bible says we're forgiven of our sin. We're made right with God when we put our faith in Jesus' payment of our fine. When we trust in Jesus' payment of our fine and we commit our life to him, the Bible says our sin's forgiven. And we can know for sure that when we die, we're going to heaven. Some of you are here today and you've been trusting in yourself or because you go to church or because you're from a great family or because you try to be a good person and you've been doing it all on your own. And the Bible says, listen, you, you've fallen short of God's standard. His standard is absolute perfection. And I don't know about you, but I've fallen short of that standard and I need someone to rescue me, to do for me what I can't do for myself. And Jesus did that. He gave up his life for you so that you could be right with God. And the Bible says that not only did he die on the cross, but that three days later, he rose again. And he defeated sin and he defeated death. And the reason we can trust Here's what's interesting. Here, here, here's what's cool. The reason that we can trust or believe or have faith that, that Jesus rose from the dead, it's not a blind leap of faith. We have the story and the eyewitness accounts of, of at least 12, 13 guys who, who gave their life for Jesus saying, listen, I saw him with my own two eyes. I saw him and I can't deny that fact. I can't deny it. I saw Jesus risen from the dead and they were willing to go for their graves, to their graves believing that fact that they saw Jesus. And so let me ask you this, who, who would knowingly die in the horrible ways that they did for a lie? Nobody would. Nobody would die in those horrible and painful ways that they did for something that they would have known to be a lie. So I want to challenge you, if you're here and you've never made that decision to commit your life to Jesus, that today is your day, now is your time to commit your life to Christ. And if you're here and you say, yeah, that, that's me. I want to commit my life to Jesus. So I, want, I, want, I want to challenge you to take out that program that you received when you came in. And at the bottom, there's a card called the connection card. Fill out that card. Check the box that says, I'm committing my life to Christ today. Take it back to our Next Step Center. We've got a free gift for you just to help you in your new relationship with Jesus. And so if that's you and you're committing your life to Christ, fill out that card and take it back to our Next Step Center. We're gonna pray. Our team's gonna come back and lead us in, in some more songs. And, and here's my, my challenge to you as, as we sing and as we pray, ask God, for the strength and the desire and the passion to be one of the 13. Someone who lives their life for Jesus, believes that Jesus rose from the dead and is willing to die for Jesus. Let's pray. God, I thank you. God, for the life of the 12. God, and as we see their lives, God, it, it challenges me God, to live a life that is sold out for you, Jesus. And God, if we really believe that this is true, then God, I pray that we would be serious about living for him who died and rose again. Paul said that for those of us who have been rescued from our sin, for those of us that have been set free, he said for those of us that have a new life now in Christ, we are now to live for him who died and rose again. And so God, I pray for every person here and at all of our campuses, Father, that you would give them desire to live a life that makes sense in light of eternity. 
that they wouldn't waste their life living for the things of this earth, for the things of this world that aren't gonna last, but they would live a life that makes sense in light of eternity. So God, as we sing right now, God, would you put that prayer on our hearts and give us that desire. It's your name we pray. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. For more information about our church or to watch other messages, you can go to our website at experiencelifenow.com. Let us know if we can serve you in any way, and we hope to see you real soon.